school is definitely not this year. Good afternoon, and welcome to the fourth presentation in the Lunch and Learn Lecture Series at the University of Maine School of Law. Over the next hour, we are going to hear Commissioner Mayhew of the Maine Department of Health and Human Services discuss Medicaid, past and present. The Commissioner has generously agreed to take questions throughout the presentation, so please feel free to raise your hand at any time, and I will try to get to you in due course. Commissioner Mayhew provides leadership, guidance, and policy direction to the largest agency in state government, the Maine Department of Health and Human Services, which has an annual budget of over $3.4 billion and more than 3,400 employees. She has served as commissioner since 2011. Commissioner Mayhew has led the LePage administration's mission to reform the department in order to control spending, transition welfare recipients, to self-sufficiency through employment, and reprioritize services to the most vulnerable, elderly, and disabled Mainers. Before being appointed commissioner by Governor Paul LePage, Mayhew served as a senior health policy advisor for the administration. Prior to joining state government, Mayhew served as vice president of the Maine Hospital Association for 11 years. She was responsible for state and federal government relations, as well as policy development and advocacy. The commissioner also managed state government relations for the Equifax Corporation in Atlanta, Georgia, and served as a legislative assistant in Washington, D.C. for Congressman William Alexander. She holds a BA in political science. DHHS serves approximately one-third of the people in Maine, providing health care and social services support to children, families, the elderly, the disabled, people with mental illness or substance abuse issues, and the poor. The department operates two state psychiatric hospitals, provides public health information, guidance, and management through the Maine Center for Disease Control and Prevention, and provides oversight to hospitals, nursing homes, and other healthcare entities throughout the Division of Licensing and Regulatory Services. Please join me in welcoming Commissioner Mayhew. Good afternoon, thank you. This is a great opportunity to leave Augusta first of all, <laughs> and, uh, and to share with you a, uh, a picture into the Department of Health and Human Services. I didn't ask, am I advancing the slides? Do I have a clicker here? I wanted to, um, first of all, it's always difficult to, in a, a brief period of time, to describe this massive agency. And just the outline alone, as you've heard, it is a... Um, it's a $3.4 billion agency. And just the expansive mission that was described from Child Welfare, the Office of Child and Family Services, to the Medicaid Office, to the Office of Aging and Disability Services, to the Office of Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services, the uh, Maine CDC, the Division of Licensing and Regulatory Services, the Office of Family Independence. So, a very broad mission, you may be aware that back in 2004, this is the byproduct of a merger of two agencies, and at that time it combined the uh, department that oversaw the mental health system, uh, along with developmental disability, into this one large agency. There's been a lot of discussion uh, over the years about whether or not this agency is too large. And let me say this about the, the programs and services. When you really think about the role of this agency and the individuals and the families that we're serving, their needs don't fit neatly into one program area. Their needs typically span across many programs. And the challenge within this agency, frankly, has been to break down the silos, the way in which programs have evolved over time or regulations have uh, developed over the years or funding streams that have actually detracted from a more comprehensive holistic approach to evaluating the services and the needs. Today I'm going to spend a little bit more time uh, primarily on the Medicaid program. And the Medicaid program, so of that 3.4 billion dollar annual budget, Me Medicaid or Main Care is 2.6 billion. So it is clearly the lion's share of the overall budget. And I think what, what we've spent the last several years focused on with this program is getting it to a point where it is not a crisis-oriented environment or a crisis-oriented decision-making process. Many of you um, may recall 
that for years, more than a decade, uh, really going back to, frankly, the 1990s, this is an agency that historically, every single year, there had been a supplemental budget or a biennial budget where there was a significant financial shortfall in the Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, you don't have to look back too far in the newspapers to recall headlines of $50 million shortfalls, $100 million shortfalls. Uh, it, during one period of time, we had an over $200 million shortfall, and I was uh, speaking earlier uh, around just university systems experiences over the last couple of years and the budget challenges. And there's a lot of analogy to how you address and grapple with uh, those situations. But fundamentally, when you are operating from a state of crisis, you're barely looking out a week, a month. Maybe, in our case, you're trying to get through the current fiscal year. But you are not planning long term. You're not thinking about what are the anticipated demands a year from now, two years from now. And so for the last several years, it has been about how do we stabilize the financial foundation for this part of the Department of Health and Human Services, which represents a significant portion of the state general fund budget, along with a significant portion of the uh, overall state budget. And you can see here, of the uh, overall general fund budget, the main care program. So we have about a billion dollars, a little more than a billion dollars in state general fund dollars in the Department of Health and Human Services. The Medicaid program is almost 800 million of that billion dollar budget. And this is just to, to put into perspective how far the program has grown over the last many years. So this, going back to 1998, the Medicaid program represented about 13% of the overall general fund expenditures. At its peak, a little more than 24%. And as we have um, worked on stabilizing it, it has been also, as you look at other competing demands, not just within the Department of Health and Human Services, but certainly across all of state government. And I, when I sit around the cabinet room table with my uh, fellow commissioners, you can imagine that these are state agencies that while the Department of Health and Human Services has been battling significant financial challenges, those agencies year after year after year were told no whether that was the Department of Education, the Department of Labor, the Department of Public Safety, as their budget needs were uh, presented in the face of a $50 million, $100 million shortfall in the Department of Health and Human Services, they were routinely told, we have no additional funds, the crisis is in the Department of Health and Human Services. And this just putting into perspective that growth, so if you were to go back a few years prior to this, in about 2002, the Medicaid program overall spending was $1.2 billion, state and federal. And you can see today, we are well over uh, $2.4 billion in direct services. $2.6 billion includes uh, the administrative costs and expenses associated with the overall management. But from $1.2 billion in 2001-2002 to today, over $2.4 billion. Now, you'll notice that there hasn't been any headlines around uh, related to a supplemental budget shortfall. So over this last year and a half, as we have worked to stabilize the financial foundation, it has allowed us to begin to reflect on and begin to address many of the deficiencies, areas that have actually been neglected over the many years in the Department of Health and Human Services. So you will think about the uh, long-term care services that the Department of Health and Human Services supports. We often think about Medicare as being the primary funder for the elderly. The fact of the matter is Medicaid, the state-funded program, obviously uh, in conjunction with federal reimbursement, Medicaid supports many more long-term care services. So the vast majority of spending in nursing facilities is supported by Medicaid. 
on average, a nursing facility's payer mix, the combination of, of revenues that they receive, on average, more than 60% is Medicaid. So as we begin to look in the Medicaid program at areas of concern where reimbursement has been uh, desperately needed to increase, you think about nursing facilities where, uh, I had one nursing facility owner say to me, we've been on a starvation diet for years because the reimbursement had not kept pace with the cost of delivering the care. And that only reflects current costs. It does not reflect what's the new model of care delivery within a nursing facility. Are there changes that they need to adopt in the physical plant structure, renovation costs that need to be taken into consideration? What you see here uh, reflects the biennial budget that was submitted back in January of 2015. And this was an opportunity in this biennial budget because we did not have a shortfall. So we had stabilized the financial foundation and had the opportunity to look at where the priorities are and where we needed to see increased reimbursement additional funds provided. So I've talked a little bit about the nursing facilities. One of the other areas that has been, uh, that has received uh, little attention, has received, was, was put into the back seat, pertains to people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. So Maine has been a leader in deinstitutionalizing. When Maine, uh, following a lawsuit back in the early 90s, Maine began to close Pineland to move away from an institutional setting for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities to community-based settings, to support people in their homes, to support people in their communities. The problem is we've not devoted the funding to actually support people in that way effectively. So imagine, think about a 75-year-old couple with a 40-year-old adult son with Down syndrome. And they've been caring for their son in their home his entire life. And now they're getting, their health is deteriorating, and their needs are increasing, and they're scared about how they're going to take care of their son. Well, for years, a waiting list has been growing with individuals like that couple's son and others being placed on a waiting list. So when I talk about a waiting list for these individuals, and there have been thousands of individuals on this waiting list, and this dates back to um, you know, mid-2000s. Under Medicaid, individuals have access who are eligible, and eligible based upon income and also based upon their disability. So people with intellectual and developmental disabilities both through their income and through their disability, are eligible for what we would consider traditional Medicaid services, being able to uh, be seen by a doctor, hospital, pharmacy, mental health. But the services and supports that we're talking about that are day programs, in, uh, supports in their homes, those are considered non-traditional services under Medicaid. You have to go through a a pretty elaborate process that I want to talk a little bit more about because Medicaid in many ways, this is the federal partnership, is an antiquated program. The regulations have not kept pace with the way in which care can be delivered today, but those regulations haven't changed. Locked in a time warp, if you will. And so for a state to have more flexibility in more effectively meeting the needs of populations like people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, you have to submit a waiver. You are waiving that person's uh, right or their right to be in a facility in order to provide them with community services, home and community-based services. Now these individuals on average, their average cost is over $100,000 a year. That's the average. Some of these individuals are over $300,000 a year. Their needs are significant. Not only their, the supports that they may have with activities of daily living, getting dressed, getting bathed, getting food, they may have significant medical complications. But I think we would all agree that that is 
one of the priority populations that should be effectively served by the Medicaid program. And yet, that couple that I just described, their son has been on a waiting list. Now, imagine all the kids who are graduating from high school with autism. They're also going on to waiting lists. Again, they can, they're getting their basic medical needs met, but that more robust, comprehensive array of services, employment supports, supported housing, being in an apartment, but having some minimal services and supports, that's where we are continuing to look at prioritizing increased funding. So you can see here, over the two-year budget, we requested over $41 million in additional funds, that Section 21 uh, policy waiver that we refer to is the comprehensive services and supports to, to help people stay in their homes longer or to be in a group home in the community. Many of the day supports, the employment supports would be part of that. What was approved ultimately by the legislature was only 14 million. So I, I use this because of the, the focus that we still have on making sure that this program, this $2.6 billion program, is accurately reflecting not only core priorities today, but how are we able to predict what the demand will be. And as I said, many of those individuals who today are diagnosed with autism that are graduating from high school, we now have a generational gap in what they are expecting for services or supports versus what was established when we closed Pineland almost 20 years ago. So we've got to be able to effectively meet that need and continue to be responsive to that changing uh, service delivery level. But that is a huge unmet need today in the Medicaid program. Nursing facilities, again, you can see, while we've made improvements, we've increased their reimbursement rate, we still are trying to keep pace with their changing costs. So nursing facilities, we requested over $24 million. The legislature appropriated 16. Now I'm going to talk a little bit more about primary care because I'm, I'm excited about where Medicaid, where the Office of Main Care Services and the Main Care Program has also gone. The, when you think about this program, it has largely been for years a transactional-based program. Invoices come in, claims come in, payments go out. And where we have been focused over the last several years <coughs> is proactively getting main care engaged with improving outcomes. At the end of the day, with the $2.4 billion direct services provided, are we improving the health and well-being of the individuals who are being supported through this program? And that is a sea change from the role that has traditionally been played by the Medicaid program. So you see one of the last uh, big priorities that we were proposing was primary care. As you work to support people getting better access to care and better management of chronic diseases, asthma, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, cancer, it all comes back to how well supported individuals are in their primary care setting. And yet, Medicaid, much like Medicare, has been more oriented around the acute episode of care. Medicaid has been focused on paying for facility-based services, hospitals, nursing facilities, the crisis-oriented episode of care, but has not maintained a commitment to primary care. Wasn't that long ago that there was a lot of publicity around doctor's offices closing their practice to Medicaid, to main care members, either severely limiting the number of main care Medicaid uh, members that they would care for, patients that they would care for, or closing their practice altogether. Those doctors argued, this is both primary care and specialists, that Medicaid's reimbursement rates were so low that it was not financial, financially feasible for, their, for those offices to continue to serve those members. So just giving someone a card 
and then not appropriately paying for the cost of delivering that care does not mean that you are guaranteeing that individual appropriate and timely access to care. So part of our proposal, and this relates to the Affordable Care Act, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about some of the initiatives there, but within the Affordable Care Act that was passed uh, several years ago, there, include, there was a provision that provided states the opportunity to, a required states, to increase their Medicaid reimbursement rates for primary care physicians and nurse practitioners and physician's assistants to Medicare's physician reimbursement rates. And under the Affordable Care Act, they would pay for that reimbursement at 100% federal dollars. The, the difference between where a state was and its reimbursement and getting to that level. That was fantastic, very much aligned with the direction that we wanted to go. The problem was, it was temporary and only for two years. And it expired at the end of December. And unlike many states that were not able to sustain that commitment, we wanted to continue to provide that reimbursement rate at the Medicare level in order to make sure that we are providing appropriate access to primary care for individuals enrolled in the Medicaid program. To sustain that, we needed $28.3 million. Now, this includes not just that reimbursement rate, but it also includes a new model of care delivery called Health Homes, and I'll, I'll share a little data on that. But the, the concept behind Health Homes is to help transform primary care so that it's not just you come in and you are part of a 15-minute visit with your physician and you are cycled in and cycled out. When you are dealing with complex medical needs, when you have um, numerous conditions, you have diabetes, you may have cardiovascular disease, the opportunity to better manage your care, to keep you out of a preventable emergency department visit, or to prevent a um, unnecessary readmission to the hospital. It depends a lot on the work within that primary care practice and a team-based setting. And so we've taken the initiative of implementing health homes, a health home model, to provide that level of support. The overall request in the biennial budget was $28 million over two years. And again, you can see that the legislature authorized significantly less than that. Question about sure. the process. So, can you maybe talk a little bit about what the reasoning was for such low appropriation, or and if you know why it was, what priorities they had to? So, you know, this is just a, a great example of any budget, any budget process. At the end of the day, it all comes down to the revenues you have and the resources you have, or your willingness to make cuts, to prioritize, to argue that this is a higher priority over the spending over here, and ultimately reach agreement. So we disagreed with the appropriations, believed that there were other programs uh, that could have been reduced or cut in order to support these priorities. The legislature did not agree with the reprioritization. And as I said, I mean, this happens in any area, whether you're talking education, uh, talking about public safety, you're going to see some discussions about uh, the reimbursement, the salaries for state police, and it's going to be pitted against some other competing uh, priority in state government. And so that is the end result because this, these proposals were not the only proposals on the table. There was a request for additional funding for the Department of Education for schools for K-12. Um, the university system, the community college system, all of those proposals are in front of, uh, certainly they start in front of their respective policy committees, and then they ultimately get in front of the appropriations committee, and they are looking at the totality of those requests and what they believe um, can and should be prioritized. The, the, the concern, of course, that, that we continue to have is it is difficult to address the harm that has already occurred. So when a nursing facility closes, as they already have in Callis, in Pittsfield, in Lubeck, in Holton, it's hard to get them back. Once you've lost that resource, especially in rural areas of the state, it is very difficult to get it back. 
and, and as, as much as we try, we are trying to get beyond <coughs> short-sighted, crisis-driven budget decision-making. Because it, you lose so much ground if you're only responding to the crisis rather than beginning to invest in, much as, again, as I said, you know, when you talk to parents whose child is about to graduate and the panic that they're experiencing, the child with uh, autism and the panic that they're experiencing about going from a school system that today is fairly robust in the services that they're receiving to knowing that your child is immediately being placed on an adult wait list. So how do we get past that? It's hard. There's always a crisis. There's always a, an urgent need, but that is the end result of that. Yeah, just looking at the numbers, the legislature gave you 45 million more than you anticipated or you requested, and then they didn't fund approximately 50 million in the three programs that you've mentioned. So. Where did they put the 95 million? A whole bunch of places or uh, one particular place? Well, of course, this was funding that we requested and we brought forward the proposals to pay for it. Uh -huh. Okay, so they rejected uh -huh. the cuts that we proposed. So they, they identified resources and funding to support uh, these increases. They added additional funds to the Department of Education, roughly 50 million in increased funding for K through 12. Um, some of it, you know, it's, it's difficult too when there are um, savings identified that may or may not materialize, but that in the way in which uh, the budget sometimes comes together, it is done through um, innovative uh, savings proposals that, that sometimes don't come home to roost until you actually go to, to fund some of these programs. And we've tried to stay away from uh, phantom savings. We want to make sure that there's a, a realistic understanding of the cost of the program and what it takes. Now, in one of these instances under primary care, and this pertains to health homes, which I do believe is an incredibly important model to the state, not just for the Medicaid program, for the transformative nature that it represents for anyone walking into a primary care practice. So the quote was, we'll only give her half of what she's requested, she, me, um, and she'll, if it's important enough to her, she'll find the money elsewhere. I mean, and, and that's just, it's, a, it's an unrealistic uh, appreciation for the competing demands within this $2.4 billion program. Uh, it is, as you know, I mean, we spent several years paying off the hospital debt. So in the last several years, the state had to come up with $750 million to pay hospitals for care that they had already provided but had not been paid for. So we are still digging out of that hole and are still attempting to address some of the, those deficiencies, but it, ultimately it involves prioritization of, of where reimbursement needs to occur. I'm curious to, <coughs> excuse me, for sort of more of a real world understanding of these numbers, and I'm just specifically like nursing facilities, because I feel like that's one that it seems like coming up with 24.2 million ought to be pretty, I mean, as a, as a request, I would be, well, we know how many nursing facilities there are, we know how much it costs to treat a single individual in a nursing facility. We're doing the math, and it's $24.2 million. You get 16. How do you, what are you not getting in those nursing facilities in order to save $8 million? Right, so it is historically, and I'm, I'm going to be very blunt about this, the argument for years and years, and you can, if you look up any analysis of Medicaid that's been written nationally, historically Medicaid programs are known for not paying the cost of care. It's just at what level they're willing to reimburse. So for hospitals, it might be 85% on the dollar of cost, not charge, but on the dollar of cost. For nursing facilities, similarly, they were being paid far less than the actual cost. So when a nursing facility comes forward and, and begins to talk about their inability to attract and retain staff, it directly relates back to what Medicaid is reimbursing because that affects their wages. If Medicaid is not paying its fair share of costs, they can't increase their wages, provide the kind of benefits that allow them to attract and retain. So for these nursing facilities, 
it, this is where ultimately it depends on other decisions they may have made. So some of the nursing facilities are owned nationally. They're part of large uh, corporate chains. Some are, are owned and grouped together locally. Some are independent. And those small independent, the one that I mentioned that closed recently in Blue Gap, was a small family-owned nursing facility. They have nowhere ultimately to go. They've been making decisions over years to allow them to stay in business. And at some point, it just comes home to roost. Callus, uh, actually Callus was part of a larger organization. But for that particular organization, that nursing facility was losing money, and they did not see it as a sustainable, viable business model that they wanted to continue to commit to. Now, when you talk to people in Callus, I mean, they were up in arms. Uh, because it now means that family members have to travel farther distances to visit a loved one who's in a nursing facility. So the pain is real if you can't keep pace with that cost of care. And, and the labor market competition, especially now with a low unemployment rate, those nursing facilities and assisted living facilities are struggling mightily to attract and retain staff. Keep going on here. So this slide is just uh, really driving home the point of those wait lists and the total cost still for the overall need. Now this includes not just for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. This also includes for our elderly. And I want to just um, underscore for the Medicaid program, 5% of the individuals enrolled in the Medicaid program account for 55% of all the spending. 5% of the members, 55% of all the spending. 20% of the main care population account for 87% of all the spending. So when you begin to look at people with intellectual and developmental disabilities and our elderly, for the most part, that represents the population uh, accounting for the most significant spend within the overall program. And these are the wait lists. Now I want to just very quickly touch upon the, the top part of this. See, I can't do this in an hour. Um, the top part of the slide for the elderly, this is where Medicaid federally is so antiquated. People want to stay home. They want to stay home as long as they can as they age. They're, they are um, certainly reluctant to move into an assisted living facility, move into a nursing facility, but Medicaid, the regulatory structure, really has not developed policies that allow people to stay home longer. Well, the areas that people need, that most people in this state today are dealing with, whether it's your mother, your father, your, your grandparents, an aunt and uncle, when they want to stay in their home long, longer, the areas that they need support with are homemaker services, meal preparation, uh, laundry, house cleaning, basic tasks that become increasingly difficult as people age. Well, Medicaid won't reimburse for those services unless they are associated with a, a larger waiver and you are in the waiver because you have a high eligibility need for nursing facility services. So before you get to that point of needing 24-7 care, you may need just some basic, simple support. So we have a program called Homemaker Services that is just that. It's entirely funded by the state. It does not leverage any federal Medicaid match. But we have significant wait lists for this program. And you can see you know, the average cost, $1,300 per person per year. But we've had wait lists of over 500, 600, and I would argue these wait lists are probably not even accurate because once you get a wait list of that size, people probably aren't even adding their names to the list. But we know that if we can better invest in lower cost interventions like homemaker services, and then there's another program, home-based care, which would be just a step up of greater services and supports that you know people who need help bathing need help getting dressed, basic functions. We can help support that person longer at home 
and reduce the need for more expensive or delay the need for more expensive 24-7 care and assisted living in a nursing facility. And these are some of the areas where we've been trying to both drive our priorities within the state budget. So for years again, there was a view that if it couldn't if it couldn't leverage a federal dollar, leverage another federal match, it wasn't as much of a priority. And this is where we've got to look at what is right for the state of Maine, what are the funding priorities that we need to commit to, regardless of whether or not we've got that federal dollar accompanying the investment. Before you go any further, Mary, can we go back to the numbers on that chart? I don't understand how the annual state cost fund is zero, just about every category except for 21. They're all Medicaid programs, which means there has to be a state contribution in order to get a federal match. You know, th this is when we look at um, the overall cost. The uh, homemaker program, I, I think because it's not a mandate, the reason why they've got it in there is zero is because it's not an eligibility program, they're not calculating the overall um, funding for that program. There is very, you're right, there is absolutely a, a state cost. It's not embedded in the budget because you can only fund what you've been appropriated in the budget. But we can certainly, this, sh this certainly should have included what the overall costs are uh, if you were to move forward and fund these programs. But I would say that, for instance, let's look at the section 29 community-based waiver, that should have <coughs> Now that is uh, one of our huge accomplishments, is we've eliminated the, the wait list for that um, section of, of policy. So, so for individuals in particular, uh, you, while you still may need more comprehensive services, at least what we did was take that gate that was this narrow for Section 29 in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, the number of people that could be supported, and we widened that gate. So for those children, in particular, who are graduating from school, rather than going from a school-based system with many services to nothing by being on an adult wait list, at least we can get people into that Section 29 array of services and supports. Again, it is not meeting the, the comprehensive needs that they may have. No, I get that, but I don't get the numbers. All this is representing is if you were funding, if you were, if you needed additional funds, there should be dollar amounts for those homemaker services because that is not fully funded. Section 29, there is absolutely a state cost uh, in the budget today to leverage the federal match. What this is pointing out for the Section 21 to fully fund the demand currently, we would need over the uh, course of two years, over $47 million. So that Section 21 number, or numbers, that's if everybody was taken off the wait list and given services? Right. For the state component. And, and really what that's looking at, not everybody comes off immediately in a 12-month period. It would be a phased in. We're also trying to assess the validity of all of the wait lists because you have people who are both on uh, receiving Section 29 services. They're also on the Section 21 wait list. Some people may be able to continue to sustain on that 29 and not immediately come on to the Section 21. Let me just, I'm going to try to get to a couple of areas that I think uh, really reflect if it's, if they're in here. You don't need to slap, you can just. Well, let me, yeah, let me just talk. Uh, I want to talk about the health homes because I think they are so pivotal both to meeting the needs of our elderly and improving the rate of increase in spending. And let me just underscore that there's been a sea change in physical health. And I want to counter that a little bit with what we see today in mental health and substance abuse. In physical health, starting with in Medicare, which is the, the much larger payer for hospitals, um, larger payer for um, other types of specialists in the state, Medicare, 15 to 20 years ago, began an effort to really move towards pay for performance, improving the quality outcomes of care. And they set the bar, and they began to attach payments to meeting that expectation for quality outcomes. And they did it using 
treatment protocols, evidence-based, research-based treatment protocols. So when you present at an emergency department suffering a heart attack, there is a treatment protocol that is expected and you are expected to adhere to it as a hospital and you are going to be evaluated based upon the percentage of time that you adhere to that protocol. Now, over time, as we start to look at other areas, so that, you know, when that first started, you had physicians and hospitals arguing, that's cookbook medicine, you don't get to tell me how to take care of my patient in the hospital. And that's not, you, don't, you never hear that today. It's understood that the value of research around treatment protocols is that they demonstrate when you adhere to this treatment protocol, you have better outcomes. People with diabetes, it's well established what the treatment protocol should be. And as the investments have been made in health information systems and electronic medical records, we have greater opportunity today to use data to manage the data. But primary care practices are still coming online with that kind of sophistication to be data informed, to be looking at their patient panel and identifying individuals who've not come in for the appropriate blood work. One of the um, initiatives that we were able to support recently was real-time notification of primary care practices when their patient was either seen in the emergency department or recently discharged from the hospital with the expectation in order to reduce the rate of a readmission for that individual that they be brought into the primary care practice for a follow-up appointment within a defined period of time. So our efforts in primary care have been in working in the creation of these health homes to build the right staffing structure within those primary care practices to bring in social workers, to bring in and utilize more effectively nurse practitioners, to understand data reporting and what it reflects. How do you compare with other primary care practices? Are your patients faring better or worse in terms of the rate of use of the emergency department, preventable use of the emergency department, preventable readmissions to the hospital, and helping to support that transformation within primary care. We've come a long way. I believe Medicaid and main care are absolutely leading on that front. And recently there was a national study, not national uh, consulting firm that did an analysis of Maine's health homes and demonstrated in our Medicaid program that we've absolutely seen a reduction in the rate of increase in spending for preventable emergency department use preventable readmissions to hospitals, attributable to the establishment of these health homes, these models of care that when implemented and adhered to can produce better outcomes. Now let me very quickly sum up that in substance abuse and mental health and obviously a lot of conversation around our efforts to respond to the heroin epidemic, to the concerns and the crisis related to opiate addictions. We similarly are working to support the delivery of effective services and treatment in mental health and in substance abuse, but they have not had the benefit of the work that's been going on for 15 to 20 years in the physical health arena around the development of treatment protocols. So as we look at, today we spend over $70 million in substance abuse as a state both through Medicaid, through a substance abuse federal block grant, through other sources of revenues. The question that we want to make sure that we're able to answer is, are those who are in need of service, are they receiving timely access to service? What are the sustained outcomes as a result of that service? And how are we evaluating innovative treatment models that improve the, the uh, completion of treatment and improve the outcomes. But that is truly an area that we need a lot more work and unfortunately we don't have that same level of effort being led at the national level as it was through Medicare. So states have been largely on their own trying to chart a course. So one of the areas that we developed was a behavioral health home model. 
for the delivery of services with, for people with severe and persistent mental illness. And similarly there, what we are trying to do is to bridge the gap between mental health services and physical health. You'll often hear, why are we so separating the head from the rest of the body? And individuals with mental illness tend to have more chronic, physical chronic diseases and die much younger because of their untreated, unmanaged, chronic diseases. So I'll very quickly tell you that with the behavioral health homes, we had a slow start. We had mental health agencies that were reluctant to sign up. They were resistant partly because of the rate of reimbursement. And this is, un this is new territory for the state. And one of the areas that is so important to me is that we're open to feedback, that we are listening to the constructive feedback about whether or not the behavioral health home model was appropriately reimbursing for the actual cost of the model. We've now increased that rate of reimbursement three times in order to better reflect what we are expecting of those behavioral health homes. We've now just seen a, a significant increase in the number of behavioral health homes that are signing up and expanding where they're delivering services. We wouldn't be able to do that if we still had a $50, $100 million deficit shortfall in the budget. But now we're able to actually look at those areas qualitatively, substantively, and make the needed investments, again, to support people, people with severe and persistent mental illness who need more comprehensive services. Now, the other big component to that model are community care teams. Because as you know, one of the biggest uh, determinants of health are some of the social supports, housing, employment, other areas of services and support. So the community care teams are also about merging the medical and the social model to provide a more comprehensive approach to that individual's needs to not only address the, the social barriers and challenges, but those will have a direct impact on improving their health outcomes. So I'm incredibly proud that we've gone from this transactionally focused program to now proactively moving the needle and engaging with providers in a way to meaningfully impact how care is being delivered to produce significant benefits to the individual's better outcomes and to provide a reduction in the rate of increase in spending that frees up funding to support other demands. You may have heard we just announced we're able to support Spring Harbor, the psychiatric hospital down in this area of the state, to bring on 12 additional adult beds. Many individuals have found themselves in emergency departments unable to be timely admitted to an inpatient psychiatric bed because of the demand and the lack of beds. And so, again, because we've been able to, to manage the program, we were able to prioritize resources and support Spring Harbor's request so that we can do a better job when people are in need of inpatient psychiatric services to get them into that bed in a timely way. I'm going to conclude there and allow for uh, any additional questions that people may have. I have one. Um, you talking about protocol adherence and this whole development of, you know, cookbook medicine, which is maybe not necessarily exactly what the situation is, but it, it kind of is that way. Can you talk about how defensive medicine has become an issue? It's, it's, it's a huge, it's a huge problem. And, and typically when we think about defensive medicine, so you come in and you present um, with certain symptoms, and the concern is that in the absence of a, a very structured research-based treatment protocol, you may find yourself having more tests done, and where this truly becomes an issue is with expensive diagnostic imaging. So one of the areas that we've been working on, first of all, is to try and understand where there are treatment protocols that would dictate whether expensive diagnostic imaging, like an MRI, like a CAT scan, where it's warranted and where it's not warranted. Part of the process that you start with is just getting good data and information out there. So we also recently launched a uh, public reporting uh, site on our Department of Health and Human Services website to see how Medicaid 
compares to Medicare and to commercial payers. Now, we're still working with the commercial payers and Medicare to set targets, but within Medicaid, we've tried to set targets to where there, we think there are still some avoidable expenditures. And one of the areas is in preventable, expensive diagnostic imaging and looking at strategies that will help to, to reach those targets. So some of this is about greater transparency. Um, there are other arguments related to um, the law and uh, what uh, physicians and other practitioners will argue uh, their fear of being sued and the inability to be um, insulated against that. And there have been efforts to, to try and create an affirmative defense if you adhere to a evidence-based treatment protocol, but those have uh, not been um, successful in the past. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Right. Just an observation on the defense of medicine, medicine thing, practical one. Um, my wife is on a script. She is sort of disagreed with it, talked to the doc, doc agreed back on. But when the script expired, the poor insurance company called the doctor's office and told them she wasn't taking her meds. She fired that insurer. Interest very interesting. And there's both sides uh, on that front. Um, when I think about medication adherence, um, especially for people with um, mental illness, severe persistent mental illness, it's, it's a huge area of focus. Um, medication management, medication adherence is, is a huge part of it. Now, there's the, the other side that you described, of course, as being an informed consumer and having a meaningful dialogue. I, I um, had a similar conversation with a clinician recently. So um, I think trying to have more time in that doctor's visit to have those conversations. It's frankly, the, it's an interesting point, too, about are the insurance companies keeping pace? with the conversations that need to occur, or do you have a one-size-fits-all approach that, that ignores some of the change that needs to occur? When I look at our pharmacy budget uh, within Medicaid and the duplication and the lack of coordination among clinicians, on the, I, I toured a, um, a group home recently for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, and I asked, how many prescriptions are these individuals on? And the numbers are staggering. They are 20 meds and, 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 and 20 medications, and that was said to me in the most matter-of-fact way. And I, there's so much more that needs to be done to question, to probe, to look at um, children with ADHD. Uh, and are there other areas of supports that could be used to reduce uh, some of the reliance on medications. But that, you know, it's, it's interesting because you get large organizations like insurance companies going down a path, uh, much like state government. They don't make mid-course adjustments as easily as we may need them to. Thank you so, so Thank much. Thank you very much.